Doing good, doing good. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our November 4th council meeting. If you would like to stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for invocation, you're welcome to. This is Wilson. Would you please pray? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us, even with all our faults. We ask your guidance tonight as we work for the citizens who elected us to keep our beautiful city safe, healthy, and thriving. In your holy name I pray. Amen. We'll call the meeting to order and have consideration to approve the agenda. Ms. Wilson, I believe you have a uh, council introduced item to add. Ms. Wilson? Council you have a council introduced item to add? I do. Okay. I do. I'm sorry. I was no. looking at the. No, it's, it's no problem. So do you want me to, to I just want to tell yes. you now that yes. yes, I do have one. Okay. And we do need to add executive session to discuss real estate. Any other changes or motion to approve as amended? I move to approve as amended. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All members voted for the motion. At uh, this time we have a visitor tonight. Uh, Ms. Cheryl Mosley is going to give us a a background and uh, introduction to Cherokee Thanksgiving. So, you come right up to the microphone. So, so. Yes, okay. welcome. Okay, uh, hi, my name is Cheryl Mosley. How many of you in here have heard of Cherokee Thanksgiving and know anything about it? Just a show of hands. Okay, so I'm gonna hand out a flyer when I finish and it tells you everything you need to know. Here's the most important thing you need to remember www.cherokeethanksgiving.com. That's our website. When you go to our website, you will find everything you need to know about Cherokee Thanksgiving, um, how to volunteer, how to donate, and all of the things that are important. This year is our 29th year, and sadly, we are, de we are missing two very important people, uh, John Powers and John Stevenson, who started Cherokee Thanksgiving. So it's been a bit of a difficult year for us. Um, and like I said, everything you need to know is on this page. So there's just a few little pieces of trivia I wanna share with you. Since 2008, Cherokee Thanksgiving has cooked and served 1,540 12 to 14 pound turkeys. <coughs> we, have process, we have cooked 1,600 gallon cans of green beans, and most importantly, we have served 24,600 meals to citizens in Cherokee County and Pigeons County. Cherokee County, or Cherokee Thanksgiving is in my heart um, for many reasons. And I think the, the most, um, one of the best ways to know about Cherokee Thanksgiving is to volunteer. Obviously, especially this year, we need money. We need you to share this website with everyone you know, with business members, anybody that if they can donate $10 or $100 or $1,000, um, 
our cost this year has almost tripled. Um, we're looking at having to spend $15,000. In 2019, we spent 6800 So we're feeding 650 more people. So our costs have gone up. But if you really want to know the heart of Cherokee Thanksgiving, jump on our website and volunteer. You will have the most amazing day with the most wonderful people. If you really want to see what's happening in this county and the poverty and the level of need that we have in Cherokee Thanksgiving, pack your car with some meals. Take someone with you. Take your children. Take your grandchildren. Go into these trailer parks. Go into these housing uh, areas. See these people that are living with holes in their floor and tarps over their roof. And when they open their refrigerator to put their meal in it, there's water. So what we need and what I'm praying for and hoping is that we will get support from the people in the city, the people in the county. Uh, spread the word. This year is an especially big year for us. Um, if it were not for Williams Brothers, Cherokee Thanksgiving would not have even happened last year. And my sweet, sweet friend, Don Stevens, called me last year, and he said, because we've touched base over the years, he said, darling, it's okay if it doesn't happen this year. But I know you'll, you'll figure it out. And by the grace of God and Williamson's brothers, we did. And they are doing that for us again this year. They are cooking for us and opening their restaurant up to us to use to fulfill it this year. So please, um, if you have any questions, you know, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, just go to our website. Find out what we're about. Celebrate Cherokee Thanksgiving and, and make this a huge part of Canton and Cherokee County. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Mosley. What was that website again? Pardon me? Cherokee Thanksgiving. www.cherokeethanksgiving.com. Cherokeethanksgiving.com. Thank you very much, and thank you for the work you're doing. We appreciate that. So. <clears throat> So tonight, before we begin our regular business meeting, we have three public hearings. We'll begin with our first public hearing, public hearing and discussion of case Z2109-004 for Jones and Cloud, Inc., requesting to rezone, rezone property from RA6, residential six units per acre, to GC, General Commercial, for an expansion of Cloud Supply Company. Mr. Patton. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, uh, this is a rezone application for uh, 1.72 acres of property located on uh, the south side of Hickory Flat Highway. Uh, it is uh, noted as uh, parcel D001 on tax map book number 91N20. Uh, they are requesting general commercial zoning. Uh, Current zoning on the subject property is RA6. The proposal is uh, for an expansion of uh, uh, Jones and Cloud Supply uh, Incorporated. The major use of uh, this property, if council rezones, would be for materials uh, storage. I'm available to answer any questions at the end of the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Patton. So at this point, we will open the public hearing. Um, we didn't have any citizens sign up for these three public hearings, but is the applicant here or someone here to, to speak on this, uh, on this case? Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Benson Chambers, here to represent the applicant Jones and Cloud, Inc. Uh, this property is located on Georgia Highway 140, commonly known as the uh, Free Home Highway, I'm sorry, <laughs> Hickory Flat Highway. It's located actually at the end of that segment at the intersection of I-575 and Hickory Flat. Interesting thing about this little segment from Marietta Road down to 575, the last building that was built in that area was 21 years ago, and that was Chandler Graphics. The building before that was more than 30 years ago, and that was Roach, I'm blown to the Roaches, but Canton Glass. There are two abandoned buildings on that particular stretch of road. 
uh, one of which was Dr. Bill Johnston's uh, vet clinic, and the other one served as the embarkation point for world travel, the Cherokee Inn. That was the Greyhound bus station. It's been closed, I think, now for almost 50 years, and it sits there just like it was then. We see this as an opportunity to bring, hopefully, a startup of some new growth and improvement in this particular area. I know the city would like to see some more growth, more value brought into that particular area. The applicant proposes to use this property for storage of landscape materials. Um, they've been in business here in Canton for quite a while, and the family's been in business for, excuse me, the family's been in Canton for many, many years. I think they've been a great asset to Canton, and I know Canton has been a great asset to them. When you look at the surrounding properties, everything that's on the northeast side across from this property, all the way from the filling station at Marietta Road, all the way to 575 is zoned general commercial. On the opposite side, the same side as this property, most of them are zoned as general commercial. And the two houses that are located directly next to it are zoned neighborhood commercial. We believe it's an appropriate classification at that current location to ask for general commercial. When you look at the site plan, uh, we're not proposing any new buildings for this property. Uh, it is a very steep property once you leave the roadway. Uh, it only has 70 feet of road frontage. The balance of what you see there is actually DOT right-of-way. And that DOT right-of-way, which is now nothing but trees, is about 150 feet deep. Uh, at the interstate side. So nothing can be done with it at all. Uh, we would appreciate your consideration of this request and ask you to look at it for purposes of general commercial. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Seeing we have no one sign up to speak, so we will close the public hearing and open it up to <laughs> council to have any questions for Mr. Patton or uh, discussion. So. Mr. Patton, I know that um, it was mentioned there'd be no building on, on the site and it'd be for storage of landscape materials. Do you know what kind of type of materials and how that would be stored? Uh, it would be similar to how the uh, landscape materials uh, are currently stored at uh, the location where they do have uh, the small office and uh, the retail sales. Uh, but uh, the storage would be uh, similar to what they uh, currently have. They don't have enough room. Uh, their sales have uh, picked up, and they're looking for additional uh, area for uh, storage of the materials. Okay, great. Ms. Wilson. I believe there was a public meeting for the adjoining property holders. And yes. I think I read that there was no opposition among those people. None that uh, was noted. Um, at their current site, everything is right on the road. Because of our require our current requirements now, when things are built, would their store would the stuff that they're storing be allowed to be right on the road, or would it have to be covered and further back? Uh, there is a setback uh, requirement. There is a companion variance application uh, that will go before the board of appeals in regards to reduction of uh, the 50 foot uh, buffer and setback areas, but uh, city council could certainly uh, consider uh, a condition of approval if uh, council is inclined to approve the zoning that uh, the landscape material stored on site would have to be uh, screen shielded through a combination of uh, fencing and or uh, berms and landscape materials itself. And then is it the employees of Cloud Supply who would be driving down there getting the stuff and bringing it back? Or is this a place where customers are gonna go drive to pick up their gravel and mulch? And uh, that was not indicated in the application. Uh, it's gonna be open for uh, uh, customers to drive through and pick up. It's gonna be both. Ms. McGrew? 
Mr. Patton, this is a uh, major corridor into the city, and I'm wondering if the applicant will be moving the ground cover materials, the sand and the gravel and the mulch, from the corner of Marietta and 140 to the storage facility that they're asking for the rezoning and maybe have plans to do something unique with that corner since it is right at our gateway and part of the placemaking initiative. It's my understanding uh, that they would uh, continue to have some uh, landscape materials on the side at the corner of Hickory Flat Highway and Marietta Road. Uh, this uh, new site further along Hickory Flat Road would be an expansion uh, of uh, storage uh, capabilities for the landscape materials. I see. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Patton. Move on to our second public hearing. It's a public hearing and discussion for cases MPA 2109-002 and CUP 2109-001 for master plan amendment and conditional use permit approval for TPA Group LLC to develop and construct 134 townhomes on the north side of Watermist Drive and the west side of Bluffs Parkway. Mr. Patton. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, council members. This is the public hearing in regards to uh, two cases, MPA 2109-002 and CUP 2109-001. Uh, the site area involved uh, with these cases is 22.22 acres. This is part of uh, Pod B off of uh, the latest uh, Bluffs Master Plan, Master Plan uh, Amendment. Uh, there are uh, townhomes that are under construction uh, within Pod B uh, that was done in two phases. Uh, this request is for additional acreage, part of that pod B. They are requesting uh, to add 134 more townhomes uh, within uh, the overall pod B. Staff does note uh, that with this application, uh, the site plan uh, reflects uh, one means of ingress, egress uh, for the 134 uh, unit staff has uh, made uh, the applicant uh, aware of uh, the city standards about two means of ingress, egress. They also are requesting uh, city council approve a 44 foot uh, wide uh, uh, access easement ingress, egress, similar to what phase one and phase two was done. Staff also notes that phase one of this development uh, that had uh, the 44 foot wide uh, private ingress egress easements were already uh, constructed and on the ground when I came to work uh, with the city in 2008. Uh, phase two of this development was an extension out of the original streets into a new phase. This uh, phase uh, that is part of this application tonight is on the north side of Water Mist Drive. I'm here to answer any questions council members may have at the end of the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Patton. At this point, we will open the public hearing and ask if the applicant or someone representing the applicant is here uh, to speak in favor. And you have a total of 10 minutes uh, to state your case. And Mr. Beppers will be keeping the time there. So. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You. My name is Joel Larkin. I'm with the law firm Sam's Larkin and Huff in Marietta. I know you all are used to seeing my partner, Parks Huff, and he's actually the person who filed this application, but he had a, an engagement he had to go to tonight. So I, I'm going to try to fill in for him and, and, and meet his expectations. Uh, as Mr. Patton indicated, uh, this is part of a, a large master plan development that was zoned 20 plus years ago. It's a mixed use development. The property before you is located just north of one of the roundabouts, uh, and it, it is designated for residential in the existing master. We're asking that we be permitted to do townhomes in that already designated residential portion of it. 
uh, this would be a continuation and a new phase of a very successful project that's underway right now. Uh, and and we, due to the success of it, we obviously would like to replicate it as much as is feasible. Uh, I understand staff has some concerns about the, the width of the road and about the entrance. Uh, we plan on having discussions with staff between now and your next meeting when you consider and vote on this. I believe that's the 18th. Uh, we, we take their, their concerns very seriously, obviously. I know one of those is uh, multiple entrances are required when you are over a certain number. So we'll need to sit with them and see if we can figure out a way to, to accommodate that request. Is, would it be okay if I don't use up my entire 10 minutes? Yes. <laughs> I think we've got a track record here on the ground, and I think you all are familiar with it. So uh, we're proud of that, so we'll stand on that, and we're happy to respond to any questions that you have, either tonight or between now and the next meeting. No, thank you. Thank you. Again, we had no one uh, sign up to speak either in favor or, or opposition, so we'll close the public hearing at this point and uh, open up the council for questions, uh, commentary, any questions for Mr. Patton? Mr. Carlin. Mr. Patton, and looking at the schematic that's here, it looks like there's a 150 foot buffer to the reservoir with the way it kind of creeps in with that, that tongue that way. Can you tell me more about that wall and what it would look like? Is it a step down towards that's built up? Is it a retaining wall? What kind of wall are we talking about? Uh, we're not exactly sure uh, other than that would be uh, something that uh, would uh, come uh, after uh, approval of uh, the master plan amendment conditional use permit, part of the construction drawings, that sort of thing. I would uh, tend to think that uh, they would have to comply with our guidelines on uh, slopes and that sort of thing. So it possibly could end up uh, being uh, a couple of uh, walls and a tiered section in between, but uh, that has not been indicated as yet. I'm not sure if the engineer is far enough along to know if it's gonna be one uh, wall or a couple of walls. Yes, okay. the topo is pretty uh, rough over there. Looks like it. If I remember right from our HGOR, talk there's it's a it's an interesting spot to try to build on the will this will approval of this interfere with any of the work that hgor is doing talking about trying to activate that section of the reservoir it should not uh the uh uh reservoir protection zone uh, if you will uh all of the development is proposed to be outside of that protection zone area which was part of the hgor uh uh, work in the area and that sort of thing. Thank you, sir. Mr. Patton, the application states that the, the portion north of Water Mist Drive was approved for single family detached homes. And I believe that's the, the, the parcel we're talking about. Was that um, part of the master plan or was that part of condition of the, the last approved uh, townhouse um, project and development? Uh, it was uh, approved uh, with the original master plan. It was approved with the master plan amendment from a few years ago. Uh, as far as residential, that's a uh, part of the reason the, these applications are before the council uh, tonight is uh, because they are uh, requesting additional uh, townhomes uh, within that pod B. Okay, thank you. Well, Mr. Tolan. Mr. Patton, do you know if the, uh, call it the look and feel of these proposed units are going to be similar to what is existing there? Uh, my suspicion is that uh, they would propose to have a similar look and feel. They will have to go through an oversight committee for review and approval. Uh, Thank you. Ms. Wilson. Uh, one of the um, things that the city ask is that the developer meet with the school board to make sure that there's no impact on the school. Has this developer done that? I didn't see anything. Best of my recollection, uh, the, the whole Bluffs development several years ago uh, uh, was taken into account with the uh, overall 750 residential units. 
and the Board of Education uh, was satisfied uh, with the original master plan approval uh, in which it specifies a maximum of 750 residential units. And so they didn't ask for any impact from the developer? The, the Not on this because it had already been accommodated and addressed Fine. previously. So it's already been addressed? Yes, ma'am. Do you know if they're paying the school anything? It was paid uh, several years ago. Okay, thank you. Also, I note that they did have a public meeting and no one attended. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Patton, on that um, 750 residential units as part of the original master plan approved, uh, can you give us an update with what has been built and what has been approved uh, to be built on the bus? Where? where we are on that number? I don't know if I've got my little cheat sheet uh, <laughs> handy. I can Get confirm back to us by uh, the next that uh, this proposal of 134 units uh, will still put uh, the, all the residential under the 750. Best of my recollection, and like I said, I've got a, a something in the office uh, where I've uh, looked at uh, all of the plats and everything that's been approved. And I want to say that there was 166 units uh, that were uh, available to be accounted for. And this proposal is certainly under that. Okay, that's, uh, that's information I was looking for. Thank you. Ms. McGrew. Thank you. Mr. Patton, would you please refresh my memory on the provisions made for trash collection from this area? There is a, a trash compactor uh, that is a, a part of the phase two uh, uh, construction. They're doing uh, their land disturbance and grading on that. And uh, they are putting a trash compactor in within phase two. If uh, staff uh, feels that uh, another one would be warranted with this phase three, we'll uh, talk with the uh, uh, the developer uh, in regards to that, but uh, there is a trash compactor proposed within phase two on can the other side of Watermist Drive. Okay, can you describe for me the community gathering places? Is there a um, pool clubhouse? Yes, ma'am, it's on the other side of Watermist Drive. On the other side, okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments at this time? Thank you, Mr. Patton. And then our third public hearing is public hearing and discussion of the annual update to capital improvements plan and five-year short-term work plan for impact fees. Mr. Patton? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, council members. Uh, City of Canton has an impact fee program a uh, requirement of uh, the state of Georgia's impact fee laws requires that uh, each government that does have an impact fee program has to uh, prepare and submit an annual update of the capital improvements element, which is part of uh, the comprehensive plan uh, for uh, impact fee programs. Uh, you do have a copy of uh, the uh, updated CIE. I will note for the council members that uh, the copy in your package, there are some items that are uh, highlighted in yellow. Those highlighted items uh, were things that uh, were recommended uh, to be uh, altered or changed uh, or they are proposed uh, new projects. For instance, in the fire section, uh, the fire chief uh, requested that the pumper truck and the aerial truck be pushed back to 2024. In uh, the police station, uh, the police station and facilities, uh, part of that uh, was the police uh, would like to have a uh, area, possibly another building uh, by the police department that could be connected to the police station uh, for an area for uh, exercise workout for the officers. Uh, so that is uh, the reason that is highlighted. Uh, pursuit management, it was requested that those be moved back uh, a year. 
And then uh, records management system is a new item. They did request to remove the uh, command center uh, vehicle that was in last year's CIE, replace it with records management system. We do have uh, a letter from the provider uh, of that, that uh, the records management system uh, will last in excess of 10 years. There are three items uh, in the Parks and Recreation that are highlighted in gray. And what uh, those areas are, are projects that have been completed, if you will. Staff uh, wanted to note somehow that those projects are completed, but City Council has the option to uh, consider whether you might want to keep these in the CIE for expansion of a trail off of a piece of a trail or expansion of uh, the uh, uh, workout equipment, gym, that sort of thing. But uh, those uh, projects uh, have been completed and it will be up to council to consider if you wanna leave it in because of potential uh, expansion of uh, those three uh, projects that have been completed. Uh, the new park areas is highlighted in yellow. That is a change. Staff uh, uh, wanted to basically put that in for every year of the five-year CIE instead of just one year. Under uh, road improvements, uh, you will see uh, Marietta Road. That was added into the CIE. Marietta Road was in older versions of the capital improvements element and there were a lot of roadway improvements that occurred with Marietta Road. But uh, the bridge uh, over Canton Creek or Town Creek uh, needs work. It needs to be replaced. It's too narrow uh, and things of that nature. So we propose uh, and hopefully uh, uh, council will agree that that is a project and I see I don't have X's in the years. I will correct that before the next meeting but that is a project uh, that would be a new one. Reservoir Drive intersection improvements, uh, uh, that uh, is new and added in. Uh, this gets to the uh, traffic signalization, uh, that intersection and uh, further up Reservoir Drive. Uh, Reservoir Drive was another uh, road that was in previous versions of the capital improvement element. Uh, that road project, uh, uh, the actual construction, if you will, was completed. So it was uh, removed. Uh, staff thought to recommend to add it back in because we do have some signalization uh, projects uh, on the horizon. I'll answer any questions uh, council members have at the conclusion of the public hearing portion. Thank you, Mr. Bratton. So at this point, we will open the public hearing. And uh, if anyone from the city, and Mr. Patton, I think, <laughs> discuss it pretty thoroughly, but is there anyone else who wants in favor? No one signed up to speak in opposition, so we will close the public hearing and open up to questions from Mr. Patton and commentary. Mr. Carlin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Patton, for the Marietta Road bridge replacement, uh, you said you'd come back and add in years for that. Do you know what years you want to add yet? I'll probably, uh, for right now, uh, uh, put it in for all five years uh, uh, to provide some flexibility uh, for council uh, uh, into the future as to when this project uh, might kick in, if you will. Okay, thank you. Would, uh, for the... Reservoir Drive intersection, that's going to be reservoir. That's not going to be the, um, the intersection at Teasley. You were talking about the intersection back with Reinhardt College. Is that right? Uh, it would actually include uh, up to uh, uh, the intersection uh, there at Teasley. Gotcha. So both intersections would be covered Correct. with that. Very good. And I know we've had some conversations about the parks addition at Burge. And I know we have some information coming in about that. We still don't know the dollar amounts yet. Um, as we get that information in, will that be able to be included uh, here as well? If it is a new product, if you will, 
not a replacement of anything that was in existence at Burge Park or an expansion of something uh, uh, that is uh, out there at Burge Park. But if it's uh, something entirely uh, new, uh, then uh, yes, it could be considered and be added in. If it doesn't make it in this year's, uh, we can certainly add it in next year's. Is there an amendment process to add it in? It's on a the yearly year? basis. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, Mr. Patton, Ms. you Jones? mentioned um, <clears throat> for simplicity putting that Marietta Road Bridge replacement in all five years. So I would assume then that, what does that equate to? $260,000 a year for five years and then adjust the budget accordingly? Well, uh, the budget uh, that is shown is just a cost estimate, if you will, sure. and that $1.3 million uh, was a dollar figure that uh, city staff uh, acquired uh, when we did some uh, improvements uh, to the, some structural improvements to the bridge uh, a few years ago. Okay, I, I guess I And we did to... add uh, an extra 10% in off of uh, the previous bid for inflation. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess I just want to understand if we're, you know, for for uh, budgetary reasons, if we put that one fifth in each of those five years, is it just a matter of moving money? And and there again, this is uh, the cost estimate is total cost of the project. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Patton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members. So we'll move into our business meeting now. You have in your packet the minutes drafts for the special called council meeting uh, on October 19th and also the council meeting draft minutes from October 21st. Any corrections, changes, uh, amendments, or a motion? I move to approve the minutes. Motion to approve and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Say nay. All members voted for the motion. <laughs> Some informational items. Uh, item A, disposition of abandoned portion of Hill Street Circle and Circle Court information. Uh, you have Mr. Charles Pollock, is that? Or... Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mayor, Council Members. My name is Chuck Pollock, and I represent uh, HIP Acquisitions, which is the owner of the um, property that we're talking about here, just on the next block. Um, back in January, um, excuse me, it's co-counsel, John Connolly. Thank you, y'all. Um, back in January, uh, Council approved a, an abandonment of the roadway, and between January and now, the road's been abandoned. It's in a, quite a state of disrepair. Um, we're here to ask that the city initiate the process of actually disposing of the property. Um, I will let Mr. Connolly address that. Again, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members, thank you for uh, adding this to the agenda today. As y'all will recall, uh, HIP Acquisitions is working on a project commonly known as Academy at Maine which is located just on behind the uh, old school building, just on the other side of City Hall. Uh, they're actually working on phase two at this particular point, and the master plan for phase two has already been approved. And uh, uh, as, as Mr. Pollock indicated, on January 21st, the city abandoned the road, and that road is actually, uh, our client actually owns all the property adjacent to the portions of the, of the road that was abandoned. And, uh, this is a Hill Street Circle and Circle Court, and uh, at the time the city abandoned it, they basically uh, indicated that the disposition would be uh, dealt with later. Our client is now to the part uh, uh, to the point of the project where they are trying to move forward, and uh, we kind of have a little bit of an issue that uh, without actual ownership of this particular track of land, which is less than a half of an acre when you add up the, the two roads. Uh, it's very difficult to get the developer and financing on when we don't have clear title to all the entire property. And so uh, we've been speaking with uh, Mr. Dyer regarding this, 
And again, our client wishes to, um, uh, to, um, to acquire those portions of the roads that were abandoned. And what we've basically have proposed to do is to hire a mutually agreeable appraiser. We've discussed uh, Randy Saxon or Jay Hembry, but anybody that the city is comfortable with, we would pay for the appraisal. And then our client would agree to pay the uh, fair market value of the, of the property. We feel like this would be a fair and equitable resolution for all parties. It would allow us to have the entire parcel clearly owned by HIP. And that would allow us to get the financing and uh, get the developer on board to feel comfortable that they can spend the money that spent to take on to go to the next uh, stage, which, uh, which I think is the land disturbance permit. Well, thank you for the information. Since this does uh, involve real estate, it's something that council may consider in executive session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we have uh, item B, informational items of Cheryl's program presentation. Ms. Anderson. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I stand before you tonight to give you a presentation on staff findings regarding Cheryl's program. <clears throat> As a part of this research, staff was asked to identify local jurisdictions that have implemented similar Cheryl's program and to inquire about the success and or failure of those programs. Also, staff inquired about the benefits of the program to the community. Lastly, staff was asked to identify which city streets are speed rated 35 miles per hour or less, which is a requirement for bicyclists to share the roads with cars and to demonstrate how those streets are connected. This snapshot from the Philadelphia's Mayor Office of Transportation and Utilities provide insights on where share roads are placed and why. According to the Philadelphia's Mayor's Office of Transportation and Utilities, there are five purposes for share roads. These include encouraging specific streets for bicycle use, guiding cyclists away from bus stops and marked cars, guiding bicyclists along a bike route, providing continuity and filling gaps in the bike network. Also, this snapshot demonstrates that in order for share roads to be installed, the street must be identify in the bicycle network plan or the appropriate plan as delineated by the jurisdiction. For this research, staff received feedback from 10 local jurisdictions, which include the cities of Brookhaven, Woodstock, Marietta, Chambly, Dunwoody, Holly Springs, Johns Creek, Alpharetta, Sandy Springs, and Roswell. Of the 10 local jurisdictions that responded, only three actually implemented some form of a Sheros program. First, Brookhaven has implemented Sheros program as a part of their bicycle, pedestrian, and trail plan. According to Patrice Russin, former community development director, now current assistant city manager, the primary benefit of the bike lanes and shared lane marking has been safety. Taking a look at Alpharetta, which has also implemented share roads in the past. However, they may not be continued in the future because of maintenance concerns. According to Eric Grave, senior transportation engineer and planner, the current recommendation is to place share roads in the center of the travel lanes with the city believes will likely reduce maintenance costs compared to installing them at the edge of the travel lane. And lastly, looking at Roswell, Roswell have share roads that have been recommended on a few corridors as identified in their bicycle and pedestrian master plan adopted in 2019. Due to increased costs, which include installation and maintenance, as well as other tasks that have been prioritized much higher over the past few years, the city has not installed any new share roads. Dave Cox, the transportation planner manager, 
state in lieu of share roads, they've been relying on share the road signs on certain corridors as the signs require little to no maintenance. Moving on to local jurisdictions that do not have share roads. First, Woodstock does not have share roads and they do not have an adopted plan that includes them. Brantley Day, former community de development director states, They've built 10-foot multi-use trails everywhere to accommodate bikes or they share the road in accordance with state laws. Focusing on the city of Marietta, in 2019, a consultant completed a light study on bike lane to identify connections and inexpensive options for implementation in the city of Marietta. The final report that was to be presented to mayor and council was shelved for the unforeseeable future and according to Mark Simmons, who is the transportation engineer, he said, since, they've, since then, they have added a few share roads in the city, but they are very fragmented and do not see much use. The city of Chambly does not have a share roads program. Also, the city of Dunwoody does not have any share roads. And according to Michael Smith, the public works director, they have considered a couple of projects in the past but the cycling community and the city council did not think that they provided much of a safety benefit. Now on to Holly Springs. Holly Springs also does not have a Sharrows program. According to Nancy Moon, the director, community development director, the only bike lane currently proposed in the city will possibly be on the Hickory Springs Parkway, which is still several years away from being constructed. Taking a look at Johns Creek. Johns Creek does not have a formal Sheryl's program. And corresponding with Brian O'Connor, the Assistant Public Works Director, staff has learned that Johns Creek has used Sheryl's a few times in the past, but they were not reinstalled after resurfacing, resurfacing was completed in those locations. And lastly, Sandy Springs also does not have Sharrows installed, even though they have a bicycle, pedestrian, and trail plan, which was adopted in 2014. According to Caitlin Schenkel, the transportation planner, Sharrows are not considered a type of bike facility, but they are something that the city considers when re repaving and restriping known bicycle routes. She further states, that she thinks the main benefit is alerting drivers that there could be cyclists on the road, but it does not provide the safety, the same safety benefit as a bike lane or a shared use path. Staff was asked to identify city streets that are speed rated 35 miles per hour or less and, how, and show how they connect. If you take a look at the map, at the map before you, you will notice that majority of the speed appropriate streets are located within the northwest, central, and southern portion of the city. Although those sections have a um, majority of the connectivity, unlike the northeastern portion of the city, connectivity is still a concern as bicyclists would only be able to travel around certain parts of the city using the identified speed appropriate streets. Being that several of the local jurisdictions have provided that they don't use Sharrows or have any formal Sharrows program for either safety concerns, cost of maintenance, and feedback from bicyclists, staff has provided potential options. These include adopting a local ordinance to allow bicyclists to ride on the sidewalks, install more sidewalks to provide connectivity throughout the city for additional bike routes, and widening existing and proposed sidewalks to allow pedestrians and bicyclists enough space to assess the sidewalk simultaneously. And these are the references used for this research. The end. Perfect. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Appreciate the information. So, any questions for Ms. Anderson? I remember us discussing this back in, I think, I want to say, 2015 or 2016 when it was brought up and there was a lot of excitement about it but uh, then I don't think there was a lot of I think there was a lot of uh, I remember a lot of red tape that had to go through because it was I think we we're looking at Holly Springs, Canton and Ball Ground um, and 
I think there was, again, I think a lot of excitement for it, but when it, the reality of, of, of making it connect was, was, was a little too much, but that was certainly great information. So, Mr. Yeah. Trevlin? Brittany, thank you for the work that you and the team did. It, it really is comprehensive, and I really appreciate it. <clears throat> I'm disappointed to hear that our neighboring cities don't really have a, an effective Cheryl's program, but it's not really surprising, um, and I'm glad that we're addressing it here in Canton. Um, you know, as, as someone who has been accused of illegally riding my bicycle around town, <laughs> um, I, I applaud the effort and look forward to the day when we have a solution. I, I do like the... The, the recommendations that you guys have made is is it, are the recommendations to adopt one of these because between the second and third one it says and or 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 just one of the, the, the three recommendation points. would be to adopt them all okay. um, based on some of the research that I've conducted most of it seems that in order for cyclists to safely ride on those sidewalks, you need to adopt a local ordinance. I could be wrong on that, but that's what most of the research that I found said. So once you adopt those local ordinances, then you would move forward to um, increasing those sidewalks. Okay. When I first started bicycling around town, I did reach out to Pacer Cordery, sorry for the pronunciation, about the uh, current ordinances, and he, I think he told me that they're conflicting. Um, one says that it's allowed on sidewalks and one says that it's disallowed so probably an opportunity to clean up uh, some ordinances that we have if only we had an ordinance review committee no, right <laughs> um, but as, as someone that rides you know on the sidewalks regularly i think if you know citizens residents visitors are respectful of pedestrians and um you know realize and respect the fact that they have the right of way um, you know, we, we can, we can fold this into the ordinance and, and, um, avoid having to spend what could probably be millions and millions of dollars on sidewalk expansion. Probably, there's probably opportunities, especially in the downtown corridor for sidewalk expansion for other uses. I'm just thinking our business owners, restaurants, th those folks would, uh, certainly appreciate, um, wider sidewalk so they could potentially do some creative things so but bottom line is i really appreciate the work you did and it, and, and these are fantastic um, recommendations so thank you yeah, i agree very thorough and I, I think starting with the ordinance and knowing that's something that we we want to do and encourage then when we do add new sidewalks or replace sidewalks we know that it's something that we want to try to accommodate when when it, it does come time to, to consider those so mr carlin you know? um i'm these are all great options. I like them. And the idea, I think John and I talked about the ordinance need to be addressed. And it's actually one of the first things I put on my list for when we get there in the ordinance committee to make sure we address. Because I certainly, I would rather pay the fine to ride on the sidewalk if there was one than to take a chance of getting hit on the road. <laughs> um, my father taught me the difference in being right and dead right. <laughs> um, Ms. Anderson, what are we looking at as far as widening the existing and proposed sidewalks? How wide do they need to be? Are this, is this a big change? Is this something that we're talking about through UDC? Is that a good question to come up later? What, what most communities are doing is they're expanding all their sidewalks to get to a certain width so that it becomes a trail. And then, you know, it's basically instead of expanding it as you replace those areas, you replace them with wider sidewalk options. I got you. So and then on the UDC side, what you would do is as you're asking development to put in sidewalks, mm -hmm. you might have a narrower sidewalk on the internal side of the development that requires that the external on the arterial roads and things like that be wider to accommodate that. Is that currently something that we require, or is that something that we would need to send over to a UDC committee to look at? Well, most of the projects that are coming to you now are master plan approved projects, and so that could be something that you could add in specifically as a condition of that approval process. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you, guys. Make sure we share the love to our committees. Right. I think it's a, a great consideration. Um, I believe most of them 
I think a couple stated in here that, that 10 feet seems to be the magic number. Like our trail, I think, is 10 feet wide, correct? Is that? Um, and I know when Woodstock came up with their master trail plan, that anyone doing a development that touched the trail, they required them to install that that portion of the trail, which which I thought was was really good. So I think it'd be great to consider something like that. So, but great, great report. Uh, starting with the the data is always the place to start, and you provided us that. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Any any announcements? We'll have our 10-minute public input. We have uh, one citizen signed up, Mr. Thomas Weaver. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Tolan. I did skip over it, an un informational. Uh, Mr. Weaver, hold on one moment. So you have in your packet uh, the, the September financials um, for your information only, but Ms. Forrester is here if anyone has any questions. Sorry, Ms. Forrester, I didn't mean, mean to skip over you, so. I was so excited to hear from Mr. <laughs> Weaver that I just got too excited and went forward, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. So now, Mr. Weaver, please, please come forward. So. <laughs> Sorry about that, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Thomas Weaver, and I reside at 131 Old Marietta. Thank you for recognizing me to speak, Mr. Mayor. Members of council, I rise today to share with you something that I trust each of you are already well familiar with, and that is the tentative unofficial election results uh, for the recent election that was held, both uh, ratifying not only the renewal of the Ed's Blast, which is of importance to me indirectly in regards to the request that I've fielded with council for the adoption of the map, which I know is in discussion, but also the voters' approval to establish uh, and make available under our aforementioned ordinance for the retail sale of distilled spirits by, cons uh, by the package for consumption off-premises. I look forward to having that new business opportunity here in town. I think that for far too long, residents of our community have had to leave our city to go and spend those dollars elsewhere, and it'll be nice to see Cap uh, Canton be able to claw back a few of those sales tax revenues that we have missed year after year due to the lack of that business opportunity in our community. So it is my hope that maybe a business entrepreneur or someone will hit the ground running with that when it becomes lawful. And it is also my hope that once those results are made official that this uh, council will be better positioned with uh, vigor anew to review my uh, app request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Move into old business and item A, discussion and possible action on street acceptance for city maintenance for town mill pod M phase one and pod N phase one. Ms. Watson. Thank you. Um, so as we discussed at the last meeting, um, the streets in town mill pod M phase one and pod N phase one are ready for acceptance. Um, they've been, uh, they're up to standards, the UDC standards. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Ms. Watson, any comments or a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion to approve and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All members voted for the motion. Item B, discussion and possible action on task order contract to Atkins for Burge Park con concept planning and survey in the amount of $28,350. Ms. Watson. Um, Yes, so as we've been discussing, staff was uh, directed to uh, move forward with Burge Park improvements, and we received a proposal from Atkins to do a survey and concept planning. Um, how they'll do that is they'll create two concept alternatives and uh, um, order of magnitude of cost, and then they will come, and we will come to city council to talk to you about that, and then we'll move forward with a final concept plan based on those uh, those comments. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Mr. Carley. I just want to say I appreciate staff's diligence in getting this done quickly. This is one of those things that's moved fast and appreciate you getting things to us quickly on that. Yep. 
Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes. Um, I, I agree also. I did want to note on the draft agreement that there is a, a, a typo, um, talks about task order 21 and, and it says professional service or traffic engineering report. Uh, I think that was I probably, probably attached the wrong. Uh, no, and, and it's, it's it, but it's this um, the right amount, but I think it just mentions the wrong okay. project and the, I think in the, the lines awesome. there. So Thank I just want to mention I'll that. Fix but it. <laughs> everything else is, is correct, but. Well, uh, it says 151,000 and then I, I just noticed that I did yeah, that too. Yeah. So I'll, <laughs> I'll fix it. <laughs> Don't expect it to repeat that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of items on this agenda. <laughs> so. Another questions, comments, motions? Move to approve. <laughs> second. So a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. All members voted for the motion. Thank you. Item C, dis discussion and possible action on task order contract to Atkins uh, for traffic engineering report for Riverstone Parkway and Hospital Drive in the amount of 14000 Ms. Watson. <laughs> yes. So as you may recall, during the rezoning application for the old hospital site, um, we did um, discuss pedestrian improvements at the intersection of Riverstone Parkway and uh, Hospital Drive, I mean Hospital, yeah, hospital Drive. Um, and so Atkins has provided a proposal for those traffic engineering report. Um, this is the first step in order to get uh, GDOT to approve any pedestrian um, staff does recommend approval of this uh, task order. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I was uh, pleasantly surprised by the amount and stuff, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, I think it's a great investment. So, questions, comments? I move to approve the task order. Second. Motion to approve, a second. Any further discussion? I think we have the same note on 151,000 on that one, but other than that, we're yes. in good shape, <laughs> as long as everybody's aware. We're aware. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed and nay. All members voted for the motion. Item D, discussion and possible action on proposed code of ordinance amendments for the retail sales of dis distilled spirits by the package liquor stores. Mr. Patton. Members, uh, we have uh, held a public hearing in regards to this ordinance uh, amendment as it relates to uh, distilled spirits by the package, commonly known as liquor stores. The referendum on Tuesday, uh, the vote, uh, as I understand it, was about 80% or so in favor. 84%. <laughs> I thought you were counting. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, you know, if city council wants to adopt these amendments, uh, uh, the city manager uh, might uh, uh, indicate uh, whether we uh, want to hold off until the vote is actually certified. But uh, the ordinance uh, uh, would uh, put all the guidelines in place uh, relative uh, to uh, the requirements for the package stores. Uh, one thing uh, staff would recommend that City Council uh, adopt an application fee of $5,000. Uh, staff's research uh, with uh, this item across the state, the majority of uh, the alcohol, uh, you know, the liquor store uh, licenses were five, six thousand dollars $6,000. There were a few of them that were 10000 Peppers, do you want to? The only thing I would note is the application fee would be $300. The license would be $5,000. Um, what we had discussed is that if that's the, the course that council wants to go, we would bring a resolution to you at the November 18th meeting for you to approve, which would amend the fee schedule to add those two things into our fee schedule. Um, as Mr. Patton said, you know, you still have to have election results certified. My suggestion would be that even if council wanted to approve this tonight, we would not have an application available until December 1st because it's gonna take us time to get the application ready. We wanna do a quick fact sheet on what the ordinance says. 
I already have had multiple phone calls <laughs> from individuals who are interested, and we want to make sure that they understand everything that they have to have to have a completed application uh, turned in. So I don't think it, I don't think if we decided to go with a December first application we shouldn't have the certified results before then. So I'm not as concerned about the election results in that application date, if that makes sense. Ms. Wilson? Just a process question. So if December 1st-ish, we have eight people come in, what's the process of? So what we have discussed is that it would be an in-person application instead of doing it online, because there's gonna be multiple things that are due at the same time. Um, I would suggest that we do the applications in person, but not start at eight o'clock in the morning, maybe it started at nine o'clock in the morning, that way staff's prepared. Um, and then it would be a first come, first serve. Um, we would timestamp all the applications, because you could have a situation where somebody turns in an application through the review process, it's not complete, they would basically be thrown out and the next correct application would come in. And it may be we only get four applications. It may be we only get one application. And ultimately, the person's going to have to have the property tied up and have a survey done that shows distance requirements, sizes, and all of that. So, you know, it's going to be a lot harder for the individual than just showing up that morning and being speculative. Okay. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. And our office uh, has, uh, besides city manager's office, our office has been fielding calls on this issue for about six weeks now. We had someone call yesterday that had three sites identified. And <laughs> they were uh, disappointed uh, when uh, we told them of uh, our regulations and uh, sent them a copy of the draft regulations that they would only be able to do uh, one uh, uh, store. <laughs> That's okay. I think we've all received those calls. Uh, and I did want to commend this council and the code and ordinance committee for having this ready uh, in case the, the referendum did pass. I don't think <laughs> I don't think we had based on past <laughs> uh, uh, issues uh, involving uh, this this uh, topic that uh, there wasn't a whole lot of doubt. But uh, citizens did did approve that, but uh, being prepared and having it ready to go. So uh, uh, I applaud you all. So. Further, Ms. Schmidt. Um, I also just wanted to thank the committee and Mr. Patton and everyone who worked so hard on this. They worked a lot harder than we did. <laughs> we just said, make sure it happens. <laughs> so I would like to move to approve the Code of Ordinance Amendment for retail sales of distilled spirits by the package. I will second that motion. Okay, motion and second. Do we need to include the fees in that or? Yeah, okay, okay, I just want to confirm that, so, okay. Any further discussion? We have a motion and a second. Just yay, Ken. <laughs> motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. nay. All members vote for the motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Member. Thank you, Mr. Patton. We'll move into new business. Uh, item A, discussion of Keep Cherokee Beautiful, Adopt a Mile Annual Program Agreement. Mr. Peppers. Commissioner Carter had presented at the last meeting and then they followed up with some information, which is back at um, my suggestion would be that if this is something that the council wants to pursue by allowing the group to do the adopt a mile program within the city that between now and the next council meeting um, staff would sit down with the group and ask some specific questions. Some of the questions that we identified or things that we identified was that uh, we would want to see a prior approval of the streets that are adopted by the city first um, because every street has different right-of-ways. We want to make sure everybody understands what the right-of-ways are, the distances and things like that. Um, there's mention in the agreement about reports on post cleanup. Um, one question is, once the cleanup's done, is Cherokee uh, Roads and Bridges coming in to pick up the material? Is the expectation that since it's in the city pick up the material um, and then making sure that any of the events for cleanup are coordinated with the city so that we're not out there at the same um, I think we can do that with a simple MOU between us and the organization and bring it back to you and and then have that formal process kind of outlined it would be more administrative at that point than anything else 
makes sense to me. So, but questions, comments? Would there be an action item for the next meeting? If we can get an MOU between now and then, we'll bring it back. Um, if not, it might be the first of December. It just depends on what we can get okay. drawn out with the group. I don't think they're going to have a problem with any of these. You know, we just need to formalize it in an agreement. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Item B. Discussion of the award of the Transportation Master Plan contract to modern mobility in the amount of $199,636.50. Ms. Watson. Thank you. Um, so it was identified in our roadmap to develop a comprehensive transportation plan for the city of Canton. Um, I just briefly wanted to go over the scope of that project prior to talking about the, um, the award of the contract. Um, so this plan will develop existing condition maps, and then it will look at future and current needs of the city, um, and it will develop a report from that that will be uh, brought to you guys for your not for your approval, but for your information um, before moving forward through a um, documentation and plan implement implementation <coughs> report, which will show short, mid, and long-term items. And then it will also have recommendations on how to receive funding for those items. And then the last task would be to uh, for the plan approval. Um, going through the uh, proposals that we received. We received three proposals. Um, of the three, two of the proposals did not meet the requirements of the RFQ. Um, so we reviewed the last um, proposal from Modern Mobility and we felt that they were highly qualified. They had uh, plenty of experience and um, they also showed how they um, would do each task in relation to the roadmap, and we felt that that was very good and informative. Um, so that the staff would recommend approval of the contract with Modern Mobility in the amount of one hundred ninety-nine thousand six hundred thirty-six dollars and forty-six cents. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Miss Watson. And I believe you uh, had for for every member the scope of work uh, uh, at at your. At your at your seat, uh, which wasn't in the packet. So, uh, so if you want to review that before the next meeting in detail, um, and then let's see here. And just to confirm that this is budgeted and it would be funded by the impact fee. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Questions, comments. Are you looking for a motion to award the contract tonight? You're no. not looking for that tonight. No. The next meeting. Do that at the next meeting, right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Mr. Carlin. Um, I see they have uh, only three. Two get disqualified. The one that survives is 63 tech points. Is that out of a hundred, or is that how is that scored? That was out of a hundred. However, the we did not put in cost numbers. Okay. Um, so that technical is just for out of 80 because 20 would be the cost. But because of the issues with the others being disqualified, we didn't count those 20 points. That makes sense. I appreciate that. No Thank problem. You. Any further questions, discussion? Seeing Ms. Watson, we'll move on to item C, discussion of resolution to submit application for transportation improvement project solicitation 2022 and funding commitment. Thank you. Um, so the Atlanta Regional Commission currently has um, transportation improvement project solicitation for 2022 out um, for projects and um, staff would like to apply for two of those projects. Um, there is a 20% match that is required by the city. Um, the first project is actually one that we already have approved professional engineering funds for the intersection of Marietta Highway and um, Highway 140. As you know, we're moving forward with um, engineering services for that. Um, I would like to apply for construction funds for that project, um, which is estimated to be $4.4 million. 
um, the city would be responsible for 20% of that, which is about 875,000. Of that, 34.2% can be paid for by impact fees. Um, and it has been our CIE update. Um, and then for the second project, we're looking at the hospital road on the north side and old Donaldson intersection improvements. It was identified in the Highway 140 traffic study as a possible project. Um, that project, it will be 2.2 million and that includes construction and um, professional engineering cost. Of that, the city would again be responsible for 20%, which is about, I think, $440,000. And then it could also, if we added it into the CIE later on, we could um, apply 34.2% of that cost to those projects. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Questions, comments? Mr. Carl? For the 140 in Old Donaldson, we don't know what that change would look like. This would be part of finding out yes, what it would. Yes, I, I did put the concept in your packet. It's the one that says Interim Conceptual Plan Area 2. Got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate that. Okay. And um, I know you've talked about going to the CIE. Is that a, um, is there any reason we wouldn't go ahead and list it as a project? now versus yes. having to come back in a year if we need to? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay. And Mr. Johnson, we just submit a resolution. Um, is it, what's the deadline for that? Um, the application's due December 15th, so it doesn't. Okay. This evening. We look at that in the next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay, great. We'll move on to the next item. Uh, discussion of the award of the transportation improvement project on Marietta Highway, Riverstone Highway uh, 140. Is that the one you just talked about, or is that that wasn't included? In, uh, is this a different one? It, it's um, it's a different. So this is for the PE funding. We're approving the actual contract with the okay engineer. So for um, Marietta Highway, Riverstone Parkway at Highway 140 intersection for design services international in the award of task order one in the amount of $95,769.37. So as I discussed a few minutes ago, um, we already have PE funding for this intersection um, and we've moved forward through two uh, rounds of RFQs as the GDOT requires for their procurement policy. Um, after those reviews, we did select Michael Baker International to move into negotiation. Um, over the last month, we've went um, back and forth with, with the uh, concept plan, or not the concept plan, but the scope and compensation schedule uh, based on recommendations by GDOT. Um, also recommended by GDOT was that we enter into a master contract for this project and then move forward with task orders. Um, that's due to changes that can fluctuate and with us having a very strict um, pricing contract with GDOT on the TIP solicitation uh, project. Um, that's their recommendation to move forward that way. Um, so I'm asking for approval of that master contract and the award of task order one in the amount of 95700 $69.37. That first task order is just for concept plan planning. Um, they will develop, it probably will look exactly like the concept we already have, <laughs> but unfortunately that's how GDOT is required to move forward with these local administered projects. Um, I do want to point out that um, we are only responsible for the 20% and then 34.2% will be paid for with impact fees. Um, the rest will be through the, the funding that we got for federal money for this project. Okay. Thank you. Any questions or comments? So you, do you want that tonight? Or no. 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 Well, it doesn't have to be tonight, no. Okay. Thank you. We're, we're just wanting them to be done in our lifetime, so that's why we're <laughs> moving ahead. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, I, I know the GDOT <laughs> process is very, very slow. So thinking ahead to the next meeting, like how short could that be? <laughs> Thank you. So we will move on. Mm -hmm. Item E: Discussion of accepting 11.069 acres below the Log Creek Dam from Bright Sasser Canton LLC. Mr. Hatabian. Well, yeah, it, it's, it's nice to be here offering something rather than asking for money for a change. <laughs> it's um, nice to have you doing yeah. that, Mr. Tavian, so. Um, uh, Bright Sasser is doing some development below the dam, and, and this is a lot of cleanup property work, and it's fairly um, not really beneficial to him. He just wants to donate it to the city and the water authority. And there's no... No strings attached, correct? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just confirming, so. Uh, uh, and I believe most of this is basically un unbuildable and. Uh, well, for him, because it's, it's somewhat landlocked between our property, Bluff Parkway, and. Right, okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Questions, comments? Yes, Ms. McGrew. Um, will this be split between the water authority yes. and the city? Yeah, 75-25. 75. 75. Yeah. We're not being divided here. No, not dividing it. It's just the ownership is 75-25. And I would mention yeah. that um, that was something that came up with the with the water authority. They may request that the quick claim deed that you have be altered to show that formula of ownership. All the other property that we co-own <coughs> up there is put that way and it's recorded as part of the deed. And so that change may come to you before the next meeting that actually spells that it's 75% owned by them and 25% owned by us, but the entire property is co-owned between the two of us. This is Cobb County, right? Correct. All right. Okay. okay. Further <laughs> questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davian. Item F, discussion of five-year contract with Axon Enterprise for Tagers, Mr. Merrifield, Chief Merrifield. Always good to see you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. I had included a memorandum that uh, Officer Sweat, our training officer, had wrote explaining the, the tasers. Uh, we currently carry the taser, I'm going to mess this up, X26P, and uh, that has been discontinued. We've had those since 2014. Uh, being discontinued, then there's no longer, we can, cannot get batteries, we can't get cartridges, uh, and the warranty would be out on it. So we began shopping around. Taser 7 is the newest, latest taser that is out there. Taser 7 uh, has some advantages, obviously, as it's new. One, it carries two cartridges as opposed to one cartridge. So if the officer were to have to use his taser and it was not effective, he could immediately fire another taser. Uh, as it stands right now, the officers, if they fire and it's not effective, they have to manually load it. By loading it, you come in front of the taser to jam it down into that. When officers are under stress, sometimes they shoot themselves in the hands while they're doing that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say that hopefully we all keep in mind that an effective taser deployment is good for the officer. It keeps the officer safe, and it also keeps the suspect safe. Because once the taser is not effective in a violent situation, the officer has only one other option, and that is deadly force. So it's imperative that our tasers are, are effective. This one has two cartridges. It also has a laser sighting that shoots out two lights that shows the officer where the probes are going to go. The current one we have right now just has one dot that goes out. We don't know what the spread of the probes are going to be. With this one, we know where the probes are going to go. That's one is going to make sure it's more effective because that's how the taser works. It has to have a good uh, distance between the, the probes for it to com com I'm sorry, complete the circuit. And it also would keep one of the probes from hitting somebody in a place that we would not want to hit them with with a taser. The taser seven has a warning arc. The officer can actually uh, engage it and it makes the sound and does an arc that would be used as a warning to someone before we have to use a taser. Tasers are very effective in just saying, I have a taser. Uh, matter of fact, years before when officers didn't, couldn't, we didn't afford tasers, officers that didn't even have tasers said, I will tase you, and people would surrender. <laughs> so 
<laughs> the ARC is, a, is, a, is very beneficial. And again, these are things that we want to do before we have to deploy any type of use of force. The Taser 7 are all yellow. Several years ago, our officers, all our tasers were dark colored, which resembled our handgun. A couple of years ago, we identified that as a problem, and through, uh, through uh, attrition, as we've been moving them out, we've been going to the yellow. But we still have several that are the dark colored. This would make sure all tasers are yellow, so all our officers would be able to distinguish between a handgun and a taser. The Taser 7, uh, we, we talked about, uh, has a accountability through downloads. As it currently stands now, if our officers use a taser, when they, they have to come back in and our training officer has to manually download. And what that does, it gives the, right now it gives us information of how many times did the officer deploy the taser, use the taser, how long did the taser go on somebody. With the taser seven, just like our body cameras, when the officers come in and put the batteries into the uh, uh, chargers, it automatically downloads the information. So we can see if the taser's been used, how it's been used, and what conditions it was used. So uh, there's a great deal that comes with that. Another benefit of the five-year besides the money, and we'll talk about that in a second, but uh, with this five-year bundle, we, uh, we come, it comes with a hook and loop suit, which we can use for training. So we could have someone put that suit on, and then we can train shooting in a special cartridges that you use. It's uh, basically like Velcro but it shows you what you would do if uh, your suspect was moving towards you or moving around. Again, that helps our officers with accuracy, and accuracy is very important for uh, taser deployment. It comes with a training target for the same reasons, and one of the really neat things about it is it will come with two virtual training headsets that uh, connect. It also comes with that headset, comes with a, uh, a Glock simulator and a taser simulator. So the officers will put on the virtual training, and we had, they allowed us to demo one, and uh, should, should Council and Mayor uh, approve this, and I would welcome any of you to try it. Uh, I tried it, and my scenario was a person was on top of a building uh, threatening suicide. They were going to jump, and they kept getting closer to the edge of the building as you're trying to get closer to them. And I can tell you that I'm not a big uh, fan of heights anyway, <laughs> but it was so vivid that I could feel my heart pumping. And when I took it off, everyone was laughing because I was taking baby steps towards the person. <laughs> but an interesting point about that scenario, too, that I, I would hope that you keep in mind, that scenario was not for a taser deployment. That scenario was specifically built for an officer officer to de-escalate the situation, not use a taser. We wouldn't use a taser when someone, matter of fact, by policy, we can't use a taser when someone is in an elevated position because it, they will fall when you, when you tase them. Uh, but it is important to know that those scenarios are not all built around actually using weapons, also de-escalating. And when those virtual uh, headsets are on, we can connect it to a big screen television and we can sit in the room and we can all see what the officer with the headset is seeing and how they're handling the situation and then rate it as a pass or fail. So uh, that's, a, that's an interesting concept. The quote that I think I included with uh, the packet actually expired October 8th. We got a new one yesterday. The good news is there's even bigger savings. It's $1,000 more saving reason, savings, reason being is because, like everything else right now, a lot of the items that we were quoted have already gone up in value, uh, but they gave us, they adjusted the savings that they would give us, the percentage, so it ended up giving us $1,000 more. Uh, so the savings at, with the bundle, with the five-year bundle, under the, the new, contra I'm sorry, quote, which actually ends November 12th, but we can get another quote, the... Uh, is $41,686.66. That's the bundle savings by going with a five-year. And then we're receiving an additional $18,143.98 because we're trading in our old X26Ps. So any questions, Mayor and Council? Thank you for the information. As, as always, you <clears throat> provide us with the information we need, and we know that... Uh, just screaming taser is a much cheaper option, but <laughs> we're, we're proud that our officers have the, the best equipment out there. They don't always surrender. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you for the information. Questions, comments, Mr. Estes? 
I just wanted to confirm. So we, you get all new uh, tasers in like day one, and then it's just paying it over five years and getting replacement cartridges and stuff, right? That is correct. Yes, sir. Forty-seven tasers for day one. Got it. Good. Is it a purchase or lease? It's it's a purchase. Okay. Got it. Mr. Carl. So I have one quick question. I know you mentioned they're they're yellow and that helps with distinguishing them. Are they also a different size than the the sidearms you guys would carry? They, are they the same size? The, Is that uh, the question? The taser's a little bit larger. You, it's a little you, bit larger. You would, you would feel the difference as well as see the difference? You would feel the difference. The problem yeah. is under stress that yeah. you lose some dexterity and sure. some concepts of sense, but they are larger and then they're yellow. And the, the important thing about the yellow is not only is it the officer deploying the taser, because sometimes under stress they may not even see, but the other officers, and there's usually in a violent situation there's going to be more than one officer, mm -hmm. the other officers can see when you're yelling taser, that's not a taser in your hand. That's not yellow and can stop the officer. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Mr. Tillman? Uh, Chief, as it relates to the cartridges, um, are, the, are the cartridges proprietary to this brand? Or I, can they be purchased on the open market? I do not know that. The Axon and the Taser is a sole source, so I can't imagine that anyone else would make them, but I could certainly check on that. Yeah, I just wonder. Uh, it looks like we've captured the cost of everything except for the actual cartridges here. I'm just curious if, if, uh, if it's proprietary, proprietary or not. I, I think my only, my only concern would be if, we're, if we deploy these in a use of force situation and for some reason something didn't go well, yeah. Exxon's not going to stand by us, I wouldn't think. And I mean, Mr. I think Mr. Dyer could speak to that. Is not going to stand by us if we're using some type of off-market or some kind of different sure. cartridge. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions, comments? You said this, um, uh, this estimate expires November 14th. November 12th. Uh, November 12th. Uh, we, we can our next estimates, I mean, our next meeting is November 18th. Do you yes, need sir. action on this tonight? I would, it would, it would make it easier to do that tonight. Because well, that's a we, yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's getting late. Yes, sir. I, I know, I know. I feel yes. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Any further okay, questions? Motions? We need. Okay. Make a motion to, to approve the, um, Second. I have a motion, a second. Any further questions or discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All members of the motion. Thank you, Thank you Chief. Yeah, thank you, Council. Item G, discussion to amend ordinance requiring an annual insurance license fee. Mr. Ingram. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Hope you all are doing well. In September, we received a letter from uh, GMA it is stated since the city's population is now in excess of 30,000, we should seriously consider raising our insurance license fee from what it is now, $75, to $100. And as a matter of fact, the law, the state law, regulates that fee based on your population. That was the reason we received this letter. And I believe uh, Ms. Uh, Fortner has handed out a copy of that letter. I wanted to make sure y'all had that to know that uh, um, you know, what their recommendation was as well. You also have in front of you a copy of the ordinance. Uh, this will be an ordinance amendment if council so chooses to, uh, is amenable to change this. So this will require two readings. So I'm not asking for action tonight. Um, if council again is amenable, what I'll do is I'll work with Ms. Fortner to put that little paragraph into a formal ordinance reading, you know, the, uh, whereas, uh, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And I'll bring that back in two weeks for council's consideration to approve that. But uh, we right now generate about thirty-five thousand dollars from that seventy-five dollar fee. So this increase to twenty-five will generate about ten to twelve thousand dollars more per year uh, for the approximately four hundred and fifty insurance companies that have to pay this. Now I'll tell you that's four hundred and fifty insurance companies. You're going to say, wait, there's not one at every corner. That's correct. A lot of insurance companies like State Farm have, a, you know, a, a dozen companies listed, you know, in different names or whatnot. So um, every insurance company has to pay that fee to the city of Kenton if they provide an insurance product that, uh, for their municipality. 
Is course. that any type, any type of insurance or? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Awesome. Questions, comments? No? No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Item H, discussion of gaming room ordinance. Mr. Dyer. Yes, recently uh, the issue of video games in businesses came up and this ordinance is based on the state law which does not allow us to regulate them except for certain matters. So this ordinance includes all the matters that we are allowed to do as a local jurisdiction to um, regulate it, which you'll see what those are. It's, it's mainly about disclosures and required uh, information that we can get from them. We get copies of their reports they turn into the state. Um, I was talking to Mr. Peppers about the implementation of this. We would probably start identifying them at the business license renewal time, sending out this information to tell them we now have this ordinance. So this uh, would be on for your adoption at the November 18th meeting. Okay. Questions, comments? Ms. McGrew? Would existing convenience stores, gas stations with uh, games, video coin operated games, have to comply with this now or if they made major improvements? They would have to comply with it now. They, okay, thank you. Once they renew their business license. Yeah, the only one that would really impact it would be the visibility mm -hmm. one. So otherwise it's just a uh, process. But they would have to become visible. Yes. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Item I, discussion of gas station ordinance. Mr. Dyer? Yes, so if you will recall, we've had a moratorium in place for a number of months now to deal with what we were calling convenience stores. It turns out to be a gas station <laughs> ordinance. Um, and this is the, it's on for a public hearing on the 18th, and you'd be able to adopt it after that. It uh, basically changes the definition of convenience store to be without fuel pumps. We used to have with or without and, and adds a definition for gas station. So this regulates gas stations, which would include convenience stores that sell gas. So um, it, as you can see, there's setbacks and advertising limitations. The form that was attached to the agenda, um, glad to see Ms. Watson has the same issue with cut and copy and paste. Um, Included extraneous provision about golf courses. So <laughs> I, I, I wonder I, I about sent that. Out a new one. <laughs> we'll have a different one on the agenda for the 18th. Awesome. Questions, comments? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dyer. Mr. Peppers. Just a couple of items. First of all, we did close on the property at the Bluffs earlier today. Action took place and we now own 320 plus acres uh, off the bluffs. Um, I was asked to give an update. Ms. McGrew had asked me about reapportionment. Uh, one of the things that um, I talked with some colleagues about since we've not done reapportionment of wards in many years in the city of Canton at uh, the city county manager's uh, uh, workshop last week was what they were doing uh, with their community. So really there's a couple of different processes you can take. One is that we can request that um, we work directly with the state's reapportionment office that's already working on Senate districts and House districts, congressional districts. Uh, to go with that process, we would reach out to our local delegation. They would then reach out on our behalf to that reapportionment office and then that reapportionment us on our maps. The other, which is a much more logical sense, is that we would work with our own mapping group. We would work on our own maps, then we would propose those maps to the reapportionment office for them to look at and verify tables and things like that. So we have met with our, our um, GIS uh, group uh, that we contract with out of InterDev. Um, they have worked on these in the past. They haven't done one in this current cycle, but they've done several of decade uh, and so um, what we are looking at now are any new standards that might be in place um, for redistricting that didn't exist 10 years ago uh, and what we would be required to do as it relates to that they're going to start uploading all the census plot 
uh, information into our mapping system. That way we can look at wards and populations based on that data. Um, our goal is going to be to be the least disruptive as we can on drawing those uh, wards. Um, and, you know, one, one criteria we've talked about is that, you know, we have six council members. You know, our, our first option would be to make sure we don't take a council member who's currently in one ward and move them into another ward, you know. Um, but it looks like based on the map and based on population, that shouldn't be an issue. We're just dealing with three wards. We're a little bit different than some other cities because all of you are elected at large. Some cities require that you can only vote within that ward and that becomes a difficulty. Um, some cities have each council member representing their own ward and that becomes a territorial difficulty. I don't see that issue with us. Um, basically what I see is that Ward 2 is gonna have to grow ge uh, geographically uh, and that that will probably <laughs> mean that wards one and three will shrink a little bit geographically um, but what we'll try to take into consideration when we're doing this is the fact that, you know, whatever geography we take in may have an approval for a project on it that's waiting on sewer. So we don't want to get them redone and then find out that, you know, we've taken Ward 2 and now it's 5,000 people larger than it probably should be. So we're going to try to bring that into, into the conversation. We hope to be able to bring some form of a map to you before the end of the calendar year for you to look at um, based on all that information. The question we have, and I don't know if you checked on this today, is whether or not we have to get approval from the legislature on a map and based on home rule we don't. Um, there was some question of that because I couldn't find any good documents on GMA's website about reapportionment. I did find a really lovely document from the Association of County Commissions problem is county officers are constitutional officers so there is some state review process so once we um, get our map reviewed and everybody's comfortable with it it would be in place for the next election cycle so thank you for sharing so one reason that GMA may not have it there's a new law passed this year uh, sort of snuck by a lot of people but um, the law requires just so you'll know that it has to be uh, one person one vote even though, which we would have because it's citywide voting um, and, they, and the districts have to be contiguous. And from now on, when we annex in a property, if it's sufficient to put things out of whack, we have to reapportion for the annexation, mm -hmm. which is what's happened here. We've just built up over the years without taking a look at it. So that's the timeline we're going to work with, and we're going to work with our local staff because they feel confident with the data to be able to provide us um, with that process. Uh, I did want to uh, note a couple of things from the operations report that I sent out to you earlier uh, this week and is available online. Uh, the city is conducting a blanket drive right now for, for homeless veterans, and we have a box at our facilities. Our box here at City Hall has been full, you know, within the first week, and I think we've had to pull out and, and create more room for that. Um, I think by the end of next week, we should have all the utilities off the Archer Street site completed. If you've, if you've looked back here, you've seen some barricades that have been added in. We're going to start construction on that soon um, because, you know, it's a good time of the year for construction, right? So... <laughs> with the utilities. We've been waiting on Comcast and Windstream. Um, <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Just throw that out there. Um, everything so far on the water pollution control plant continues to be on schedule, uh, and I think you've seen the updates on that. And then the other thing I wanted to note is that EPD did approve all of our designs on our water treatment side on the flocculators and the intake screens, uh, so that was good news for us as well. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Mr. Peppers? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Wilson has a council introduced item. I do. <laughs> Last year, a constituent asked if she might place a plaque on one of the city's existing park benches to honor her uncle, who is a former council member. So this was the impetus for the proposal that I placed at your, play, at your desk tonight. 
I visit Rollator Park in Cave Springs, Georgia quite frequently and noticed their bench memorial program. And so I started doing a little research. This program will offer an individual or corporation the opportunity to honor or memorialize a loved one or employee. To summarize, the cost for pur purchasing a plaque limited to four lines and 16 letters per line installed on an existing park bench will be $200. The city will be responsible for choosing a bench and installing the plaque. To purchase a bench and a plaque, the cost is $1,300. The city will determine the location for the bench and plaque and will install. All proceeds and expenditures will be made from the general fund. Any shortage or overage will be reported at the end of each fiscal year and a budget amendment will be issued if necessary. Adam Dobson will oversee the program and Lauren Johnson will coordinate the kickoff and marketing for the program. And I have talked with Mr. Peppers, Ms. Johnson, and Mr. Dobson, and they've all agreed to this. So, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you for following up on that. And I, th I think, um, uh, I, I know you sent me a draft earlier, and those numbers have changed a little bit. Is that just to, to cover did. the actual cost of? Right. Of, the, I, I so those $1,300 covers the cost on the of the so. with, um, with a printing company, <coughs> and then I checked with Mr. Dobson about the cost for a bench. Definitely. So that's how I came up with the numbers. Yeah, great work. So and They should cover the cost for everything. Awesome. Questions? Ms. McGreer? No? Okay. Just a check. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Good work. I appreciate it. I look forward to getting started. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Yes. When you asked if there were any announcements, I didn't think of this one. If you would permit me, I would. I know. <laughs> I'm such a bother. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago, a woman by the name of Debbie Sloss got in touch with me, and she is part of an organization, and there are two. Um, there's one name I, I can't remember right now, but the other one is the Gray Project. Uh, and they care for the community cats that live in the kudzu at the lower parking lot. And uh, these cats have been trapped, they've been spayed or neutered, and they have been returned to the um, landscape that they are accustomed to. The construction of the parking garage is going to disrupt them and possibly put them in danger. And I know people think, eh, wild cats, they have a really good purpose for the city in keeping unwanted rodents cut down. You know, we're not overrun, uh, not to mention the rodent that I had to stop for to not run over it as it crossed in front of me on Main Street one day. But um, in our conversations on how to solve the problem of we can't relocate wild cats, they just don't do that. And what we could do, so Mr. Peppers uh, graciously offered that the city would build a new cat feeding station and we could put it in the upper parking lot while the uh, construction is going on and transition the cats to the top. Well, Public Works has built a most beautiful chalet. I th think you may have seen it in the uh, parking deck up here, the parking lot. Um, long story short, or really long story cut medium, um, <laughs> there's a ribbon cutting for the Caddy Shack or chalet. We haven't come up with a name <laughs> for it yet. Uh, there's a ribbon cutting Tuesday the ninth at 12.30 and everyone's invited. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Green. <laughs> Why is that funny, Mr. Dyer? I'm not good at that thing. And thank you, Mr. Peppers and Public Works and Ms. Johnson for your help in this project. I truly appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Hooker. So I uh, only have one quick thing, and I know the election has not been certified, but I don't think these votes are going to change. Uh, so I want to congratulate Mr. Carlin and Ms. McGrew on their re-election, and uh, also uh, congratulate Dwayne Waterman, who will uh, be the new city councilman uh, January 6th, I believe, is the, uh, the swearing in, uh, in, in Ward uh, 3. So congratulations to all. So that's all I have, and I will...
entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss real estate. Motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss real estate. Second. A motion, a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? All members voted for the motion. We are adjourned. Yeah, let's take a five minute uh, break uh, while people clear the auditorium.